five, four, three, two, one. Hi everybody and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Katrina McGuinness. I'm a partner in Mercer in Ireland and I lead our Irish defined contribution business. I'm also a member, a board member of CFA Society Ireland and my role today is to moderate this session. Throughout the webinar, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat feature for questions, use the Q&A feature instead. It's a little bit further to the left. I would also encourage you all to like other people's questions and those with the most likes will float to the top. I'm going to be monitoring the questions. I'll prioritize the ones with the most likes and I'll ask them to our expert, Lionel Martellini. Lionel is a professor of finance at EdHEC Business School and the director of EdHEC Risk Institute. He taught at University of Southern California, UC Berkeley and Princeton University. He is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Portfolio Management, the Journal of Alternative Investments and the Journal of Retirement. And he consults for large institutional investors, investment banks and asset management firms on questions related to risk and asset allocation. In addition to his various degrees and accomplishments in finance, Lionel also holds a PhD in relativistic astrophysics and is a member of the LIGO Virgo International Collaboration for the Observation of Gravitational Waves. So today on a topic, topic closer to Earth, Lionel will be discussing factor investing and his recent paper on its application in asset liability management. Lionel, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today and the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Katrina, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today and to share some insights about uh, factor investing in asset liability management. This is based on a research paper which is made available to you. So for those of you who want a little bit more details, then feel free to dig in the, the, the paper as well. Um, so the point we're going to try and make today is that factor investing is actually uh, useful. The factor investing perspective or the factor lens perspective is actually useful at uh, various places in a formal liability driven investing process. So these are the, the few points that we're going to make and hopefully they will become clear as we move along. Okay, so first of all, let me argue that liability driven investing and factor investing are probably two of the most important pieces of innovations in investment management over the past 20 years. These are the most substantial developments that we have seen. They are not just, you know, pure, some kind of uh, uh, marketing, you know, uh, buzz that will, you know, uh, vanish uh, quickly around the corner. They are profound and substantial innovations that, that we've been looking at. Now, let's start with the LDI first, liability driven investing. Well, liability driven investing is a very simple and very uh, basic approach that, sta that states that liability driven investors, so pension funds or insurance companies, for example, who are facing liabilities, they should be thinking in terms of their allocation, they should be thinking in terms of two key building blocks. On the one hand, they should be holding a performance seeking portfolio. And on the, one, the other hand, they should be holding a liability hedging portfolio. Now, if you think about the focus of the performance seeking portfolio, why do we need a performance seeking portfolio in the first place? Well, if you look closely at the rationale for holding a performance seeking portfolio, well, then you quickly come to the understanding that the raison d'etre of that performance seeking portfolio is efficient harvesting of factor risk premia across and within asset classes. So here, immediately, the focus on factor and factor investing and harvesting of factor risk premia is just obvious just at the start of the LDI process. Now, if we move on down the list of the key ingredients of LDI, the next one is the liability hedging portfolio. Now, if you look closely at what the liability hedging portfolio is supposed to accomplish, then what you find is that it's, it's, it has a focus, a natural focus on an inefficient matching of factor exposure, factor risk exposures on the asset and the liability side. So here again, the factor lens proved to be critically useful when trying to implement a sound LDI process. 
Now, the last degree of freedom, once you've been able to uh, build for yourself as an in, institutional investor, you've been able to build for yourself a well-diversified performance-seeking portfolio and, and, and a pretty uh, efficient liability hedging portfolio, the last question is how much should we invest with, to, into these two building blocks? Okay. Now, we know that the answer to that question is actually not coming out of fancy financial engineering and complex math uh, analysis. The answer to, the, to this question is actually pretty simple. You are going to invest as much as possible in the performance assets until you have exhausted your risk budget. And what the risk budget is, well, you know, for liability driven investor, the risk budget is typically, typically something like volatility of the funding ratio or max drawdown of the assets, but not the absolute level of the asset, the assets relative to the uh, liability. So again, it's a max relative drawdown. Now, it turns out if we have time at the end of this uh, presentation, I will argue that some additional benefit is actually expected from taking on the factor lens when it comes to the uh, smartest possible way to spend this risk budget. And again, we will claim that a broad factor investing perspective encompassing the factors that are important on the asset side and the factors that are important on the liability side could be of, of use as well. Okay, so let's start now with the first question, which is how can factor investing help when in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the process of constructing a well-diversified performance-seeking portfolio. Okay, well, this is all about the rise of factor investing, which has been a big story over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, the concept is pretty simple and meaningful. And, you know, let me quote a couple of my colleagues that have made very clearly and actually very eloquently a point about why factors are useful. Well, factors are to assets what nutrients are to food. Eating right just requires you to look through labels to understand the content. In the same way, investing right um, means, well, we should look through asset class labels, which can be confusing and somewhat arbitrary, and we should be looking at the underlying risk factors. And of course, the concern is if you don't do it, uh, an otherwise uh, seemingly well-diversified allocation in terms of asset classes can actually hide underneath a fairly concentrated portfolio of factor exposures. So if you really care about diversifying your portfolio, you should care about what matters most. In other words, the factors and not, not the assets. So this is a quote from our colleague Andrew Wang, who used to be at Columbia University and now, as you probably know, is head of factor investing uh, with BlackRock. Then there's another quote from Eugene Fama, Nobel Prize winning economist for his work in finance, a lot of different contributions. But here is what he says. It's very simple. All we really say in finance is hold diversified portfolios whatever, along whatever tilt that you choose. And by tilt, what he actually means is along any factor exposure that you choose. So it's a very simple prescription again that says, well, pick one or several factor exposures and then try and diversify away whatever is not rewarded when trying to um, harvest those factor exposures. Okay, sounds good. Now, what is the starting point? Uh, before we move on to the starting point, let's, let's recognize that if the concept is simple and meaningful, implementation is a bit more tricky. Inequity market, which is uh, the, the, the focus of the, 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 the few minutes that will follow in my discussion, I think it's fair to say that relatively consensual factors exist. Um, we should all, of course take this statement with a grain of salt. There's nothing consensual in finance ever. And people in academia and the industry, they would fight uh, very, very long and, 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 and severe fights about which factors make sense, which factors do not make sense. But at least there's a broad consensus that there's a short list of factors that we are most interested in. And also there's high capacity, which is very important when it comes to harvesting those risk premium. Now, in bond markets, we are clearly looking at this is new frontiers. This is where all the action is going to take place in the years ahead. We do have access to consensual factors or relatively consensual factors, but there's a little bit of, of a more difficult situation because there's lower capacity. The data is a little more messy. It's a bit more complex, of course, as always in bond markets. 
let me take the liberty to uh, recommend uh, you attending a next webinar, another CFA webinar by my colleague Ricardo, Ricardo Rebonato from MetaCrisk Institute as well. And he's going to talk about factor investing in, in fixed income markets. And that's scheduled for October 20. Um, now, the approach can be extended to multi-asset perspective, but consensual factors do not necessarily exist for a multi-asset perspective. And therefore, we have to work with implicit or explicit factor models that we have to, you know, statistically estimate, and that's a bit more complex. Okay. Now, why do we need factor investing in the first place? What's wrong with the default option that we all have been using forever um, in terms of a benchmark for passive or active money management? Well, you know, most of us have been using a cap-weighted index, let's call it the S&P 500 index as a benchmark. Now, the point I'm gonna make is the S&P 500 index as a benchmark doesn't allow you to do a good job at harvesting risk premium uh, within equity market. That will be the point I'm gonna make. Now, there are two reasons, not one, but two reasons why a cap-weighted index is not a good starting point, even though it is most commonly used or it has been most commonly used as a default starting point. The problem number one is that cap-weighted indices are not well diversified. And if they are not well diversified, they would allow you to harvest risk premia, but on top of these risk premia, there will come a lot of unrewarded risks that you're still going to be holding. And this is due to a very strong concentration in some of the largest cap stocks. I mean, by now, I think the point has, may, has been made very clear, but it just give me these couple of examples. If you look at the five biggest stocks in the S&P 500 index, in July 2018, well, the weight in the five biggest stocks was equal to the weight in the bottom 282 stocks. So to give you a sense of the big difference between stocks like Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet, and you know, Google, and Facebook, and Microsoft, and then compare to the rest of those stocks, which, which are otherwise large cap stocks, because they are still part of the uh, S&P 500 universe, but they are dwarfed in terms of their contribution by these five guys. Now, if you look at the same situation two years later, in August 2020, that number went up to 389. So five stocks combined have the same market cap as the, the bottom 389. So that clearly tells us that the cross-sectional dispersion of market cap is not very even. It's very concentrated in very few stocks. Is it good? Is it bad? Well. It's good when those stocks perform well, but again, clearly it forces us to hold a, an excess of unrewarded risk, which is not good because you know, this unrewarded specific risk is, as the name says, unrewarded. So that shouldn't be part of our, uh, the way we spend risk budgets. Um, this gives a sense of uh, the total weight in those five stocks in the, uh, you know, in the, in the five, in the, in the S&P 500 index. And we see that now at the current time, the combined allocation to these five larger stocks is actually higher than what it was at the peak of the tech bubble. These are not the same stocks, apart from Microsoft in this case, which is, which used to be one of the top five and is still in the top five. But as we can see, at the top of the tech bubble, there was a real concern of massive uh, under diversification because of this increasing weight in those few stocks. Well, we are in the same situation. Well, actually in a worse situation today. So that's the first problem. Now pro that's problem number one. Problem number two, which is independent, is not only are we overweighting a few stocks leading to a poorly diversified portfolio. But it turns out that the few stocks that we are overweighting actually do not have the right factor tilt. In other words, by the very construction of a cap weighted index, we are going to overweight large cap and growth stocks. Now, I have nothing against large cap stocks and growth stocks, but it is fair to say that, you know, 20, 50 years, 30, 50 years of academic research and industry research combined have shown that value and small cap instead are the rewarded factors. So in other words, value and small cap stocks are riskier than um, growth and large cap stocks. And because they're riskier, they command a risk premium. So if you're in the business of harvesting the value premium and the size premium, 
Well, you know, using a cap weighted index as a benchmark is not a good starting point because if anything, you're not harvesting those premia, you're paying those premia because your portfolio is tilted towards uh, growth and large cap. Okay, that's just a graph that explains that, you know, uh, over representation of large cap stocks and, and growth stocks in the S&P 500 index, as we all know. So what is the value proposition of factor investing? Well, the value proposition of factor investing is actu actually very simple. It just says, well, let's take those words from Eugene Fama at face value, okay? And if all we really need to do in finance is to hold diversified portfolios against tilts that we would be choosing, well, precisely what happens if we do that? What, what exactly would we gain if we did that? So this is a table maybe a little bit of small font, but I hope everyone is gonna be able to see those numbers. I think you are able to see those numbers. And in this table, we see um, annualized return volatility and sharp ratio for uh, different universes and different weighting schemes apply to these universes. And the first thing that you see is that you cap weighted index on this period of time, which is 1970 to 2016, that the cap weighted index has a sharp ratio of 33%. That's the S&P 500 index. Now, if you select half of the universe, so 250 stocks out of the 500, so that we have a focus on the smallest cap stocks, let's call them mid cap, not small cap, obviously, because we're still within the S&P 500 universe. Let's call them value, let's call them past winners, and let's call them lower stocks. Well, these selected portfolios, let's call them tilted, factor tilted portfolios, all of them, they have a better sharp ratio, a higher reward. What, why do they have a higher reward? Well, they have a higher reward, not because we are now holding better diversified portfolio. If anything, we're holding a cap weighted portfolio of 250 stocks, as opposed to be holding a cap weighted portfolio of 500 stocks. So the, 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 the cap weighted portfolio of 500 stock was fairly concentrated. The one with half as many stocks is also even more concentrated. So we haven't fixed problem number one, which was the lack of diversification, but at least we fixed problem number two, which was we are now dedicating our attention to have a factor tilt that makes sense. In other words, we're harvesting the, 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 the value, sorry, the size, the value, the uh, momentum, and the level premium that translates into a higher risk adjusted performance. Now, if in a second step, what we do is we use another weighting scheme, one that will give you a more balanced portfolio. And we are not even trying to be fancy here. We're just using an equally weighting scheme. Of course, you can do better. You can use risk parity, minimum variance, and other proxies for a max sharp ratio portfolio. But even if you do a simple equally weighted portfolio, you get a further improvement in the sharp ratio, by the way, whatever the selection you're looking at for the broad universe, as well as for the factor tilted universes. Now, where is this second order improvement coming from? Well, it's coming from the fact that now through the better, more diversified portfolio, we are diversifying away some of the unrewarded risk. Okay, well, that's what factor investing is all about. Now, a few words about uh, questions that some of you or most of you have probably in mind. Okay, uh, is factor investing going to work all the time? Is it gonna deliver all the time? Am I, am I going to be able to outperform the cap weighted benchmark all the time? Well, the answer is of course not. That, that cannot be the case. Of course, those consensual factors such as value size, momentum, low volume, and you know, others like investment, profitability, you name them, right? They, they will disappoint. Not only are they, sorry, I'm going a little fast. Not only are they going to disappoint, but they actually are going to disappoint you at the worst possible times. In other words, they are going to disappoint you in times of crisis, which is the moment when you need you know, performance the most. Well, that's exactly when they will disappoint you. Now, this is actually the very reason why they are rewarded in the first place. So there would be something internally inconsistent if we were to claim that we would like to harvest risk premia and also that we would like to outperform in, in bad times. No, the reason why we can get access to risk premia is because we're holding 
factor tilted portfolios that are riskier than the market. And those fact tilted portfolio will do very bad in those very bad times. And because we expect them to do bad in bad times, we expect a reward for holding them across all other scenarios. So on average, across all scenarios, including the good, the bad, and the ugly scenarios, then we're gonna get a higher uh, performance, a risk premium as we call it. But in the ugly scenario, we will certainly underperform. As this uh, uh, picture here suggests on, 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 on a long period of time again, some of these factors in a long short way have underperformed by a lot or by a substantial amount in quite a few uh, consecutive years. So it's not like uh, under, uh, underperformance can last for a little while, right? But of course, overall, they have been posting a mostly positive performance. Now, maybe another question that you guys have in mind is, okay, we talk about crisis in general, but how, how have they performed during the COVID crisis? Well, not really well. I mean, depends which one we're talking about. But if you look at market beta neutralized version of size and value, and perhaps, I, I, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend time here explaining why it's important to market beta neutralize our factors. I'll be happy to uh, talk about it if, in case there are questions related to this broad uh, topic. But what I'm going to say is that if you take fair representation of size and value, they have, they have actually posted strongly negative returns in Q1 2020. Minus 14% for small minus big, which is the size factor, and minus 16% in a, in a long short way for the value factor. Well, that was to be expected. These are times when those companies that you know, hold lots of tangible assets and they are more fragile, they will be hurt even more than the market as a whole. Uh, when things like you know, the COVID, uh, crisis and economic implications actually happen. Now, what we find on the other hand is momentum and level have actually uh, keep on performing and posting a positive performance, which probably suggests that these are not necessarily factors with a rational risk premium explanation. They are more anomalies, or at least we have to think a little more about what the explanations are. Okay, well, again, I'm ha very happy to come back to some of these questions if, if, uh, if people have an interest in the Q&A uh, side. So I've got something like 10 minutes left. So I think it's a good time for me now to move on to the next step, which is, okay, factor investing seems to be pretty useful when it came to uh, building the performance-seeking portfolio and doing a good job at efficiently harvesting risk premium and diversifying away whatever was not rewarded. Okay, fine. Now, what happens when it comes to liability hedging portfolio? Is factor investing of any use in that context? The answer is yes. So you can improve the design or the construction of your liability hedging portfolio with factor investing. So let me explain that. So let's consider what we call a retirement bond. And a retirement bond is a fictitious asset that doesn't exist that pays let's say 20 annual cash flows from age 65 to age 85. And I call it a retirement bond because for any one of us, it's a very convenient asset if it existed that would pay replacement income when we needed the most, which is the first 20 years in retirement, okay? Now, these retirement bonds are very good candidates for entering liability hedging portfolios for individuals. And the equivalent of these aggregate retirement bonds are actually exactly what pension funds need when it comes to defeasing their liabilities, right? Now, the problem is these bonds do not exist. Most bonds don't pay cash flows to me. If I'm buying a bond now, let's say I'm buying a you know, 10 year treasury bond, it's gonna start paying cash flows now. Well, I don't need them now. I need them when I retire, presumably in some amount of time ahead of me, right? I don't need the cash flows now. So it's gonna pay coupon, coupon, coupon payment plus a big principal in the end. That's not what I need. What I need is nothing until I retire. And at age 65, say if I retire at age 65, I'd be happy to get replacement income, hopefully cost of living adjusted starting at age 65. So these bonds, retirement bonds, unfortunately don't exist. And the key question is, can we replicate them? 
That's the whole focus of reliability hedging portfolio or goal hedging portfolio. Can we replicate them efficiently using available bonds? The answer is yes. And precisely what the kind of techniques that allow us to replicate those uh, cash flows that we need, those replacement income cash flows that we need, are techniques known as duration or duration convexity hedging. And when you look carefully at duration and duration convexity, well, this is what they say. They say you should match the first order for duration and first and second order for duration convexity. Um, uh, first and second order exposure of your portfolio on the asset side with respect to the first and second order sensitivity of your uh, portfolio on the liability side. In other words, when it comes to exposure to changes in the level of interest rates, your asset portfolio should behave like your liability portfolio. So it's all a question of factor matching, factor exposure matching. Yeah, well, there again, we are back to factor investing, but with a different focus. We're not trying to harvest risk premium. We are trying to neutralize the impact of unexpected changes in uh, those risk factors by holding the same exposure on the assets and on the liability side. It turns out that if you want to improve those factor investing techniques, you should hedge with respect not only to changes in the level of the yield curve, but also to changes in the shape of the yield curve. And what I have in mind in particular are changes in slope, talking about steepening or flattening moves, which can have a very important impact on your funding ratio if you don't have the same exposure to steepening and flattening at the on the asset side and on the liability side. And then I'm also thinking about the curvature of the yield curve as well. So there are at least three very consensual factors, level, slope, and convexity curvature of the yield curve that we should do a good job in terms of matching exposure with respect to the th these three factors on the asset side and on the liability side. Um, let me give you just here a quick example. So what we do here is there's the solid line which shows the time evolution of the exposure that I call D0 of the retirement bond, which are the replacement income cash flows, which are the liabilities for my investor uh, with respect to changes in the level of interest rate. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do exact duration convexity matching. And the exact duration convexity matching is this uh, dotted line here. Now, when I'm looking at changes in exposure, uh, matching the exposure of changes in the level, I'm, I'm doing a very good job. Now, whenever I'm now looking at exposure with respect to changes in the slope, now there's a problem because this is what changes in, uh, this is what the exposure of the liabilities, the solid line is the exposure of the, the time variation, the time evolution of the exposure of my liabilities with respect to steepening and flattening move. And here is what my duration or duration convexity portfolio is doing. It's not doing a good job at all there's a big mismatch in terms of factor exposure. That's in terms of D1, which is the second factor, which is level, uh, sorry, slope of the yield curve. And the same applies to D2, which is the convexity factor or the curvature factor. So what we should be doing instead is we should be matching the first factor exposure to the first factors, but also the second factor and the third factor. This is the strategy that I'm looking at here which has a funny name, but that funny name says I'm gonna, there's the three here that says I'm gonna match the exposure with respect not only to one, but to three factors. Then this is the one that is the dotted line, but the pale dotted line. And that one, as you can see, not only does a good job at matching exposure with respect to the level, but also exposure with respect to changes in slope and curvature as well. What's the impact? Well, the impact is if you hedge only changes in uh, the level, then that will generate a funding ratio volatility of 22% for your hedging portfolio. 22% is not good. Your hedging portfolio should have a low volatility. Now, if you hedge the three first factors, then you take it down to 6%. So that's a big, big increase in terms of funding ratio volatility, which is one of these uh, risk budgets that people are looking at. 
okay, what next? Well, next is now I have those two building blocks. Presumably I did a good job at constructing each one of them using insights from the factor lens, the factor perspective was useful both for the PSP and for the LHP. And I've got something like two minutes to try and convince you that this factor lens is also gonna prove useful in terms of improving the interaction between these two building blocks. So let me try and explain that. First of all, you can measure the degree of overlap between assets and liabilities with a multi-class factor model. So as opposed to having a factor model for the assets and a factor for, let's say for equity and a factor model for the liabilities in this case for uh, changes in the yield curve, I'm gonna try and come up with a comprehensive multi-asset stock bonds, if you will, factor model, at least stock bonds in terms of multi-asset. Now, in the paper, we use a very simple eight-factor asset liability management model with the standard, uh, you know, equity factors uh, plus, you know, some fixed income factors. In this case, we're using level of interest rates, which is the one we talked about, the term spread, which is the slope of the yield curve. And I'm also using the credit spread because it's actually proved to be useful for uh, both assets and liabilities depending on the discount rates, but I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Now, this model can be used to construct equity portfolios that has a better alignment with the liabilities. So in other words, when I'm constructing my equity portfolio, I'm using factor building blocks. I'm using size, value, momentum, level, perhaps investment, profitability. Now, what I'm gonna do is as opposed to holding, say, an equally weighted portfolios, portfolio of these four or six factors, I'm gonna try and hold a portfolio of these factors that will minimize the distance between the factor exposure in, on the liability side. So to make a long story short, I'm gonna try and make my performance seeking equity portfolio a bit more liability friendly, a bit more aligned with the liabilities. Okay, what happens if we do that? So this is the broad index. So that's again, S&P 500 index, and that's what I call minimum distance. It's a portfolio of six factor indices, which has been optimized to minimize the distance in terms of factor exposure with respect to the kind of factor exposure that I have on the liability side. And what is it that you find? So the time, time is off now. That's what my timer is telling me. Okay, so let me take a few seconds for conclusion. What you find in this case is that the maximum relative drawdown, so the relative, the maximum drawdown of the funding ratio, if you will, is actually higher with a broad index compared to this minimum distance, liability friendly index. Why is it lower with this minimum distance? Well, because it is somewhat aligned with the liabilities. Now, this is an equity portfolio. It's still very risky with respect to the liabilities. And this relative drawdown is very big, of course, because we have been looking at severe bear market in, in that period of time. But what I'm saying is it's still better than that of the cap weighted index. Because of this, I can allocate more. So if I'm assuming a 40% allocation to stocks on the basis of the cap weighted index, I can allocate all the way to 50 or even 51% almost to the better, to the more liability friendly portfolio, equity portfolio for the same risk budget. Now this is the risk budget at the overall asset allocation level, which is 60, 40% in stocks and 60% in liability hedging instruments, right? So if, your pension fund was happy to hold 40%. That means they were implicitly happy to uh, have a max relative drawdown as, as big as 40%. Well, for the same max relative drawdown, I can now allocate all the way to 50 or 51%. Now that has tremendous positive implications because I'm allocating more dollars to equity and therefore I'm enjoying a better benefit of the equity risk premium. Well, or I should say of the equity risk premia, because of course, as we have seen, there are multiple uh, risk premia to be harvested. That has a very strong positive impact in terms of cumulative relative return, namely returns with respect to the uh, liabilities. Okay, we can even do a little better if we use minimum variance weighted version of the factor indices, but 
I'm going to stop at this point. And I'm now going to stop sharing my slides. And I'm very happy to take questions if there are any questions. Great. Yeah, no, there's a lot of questions coming in, Lionel. Thank okay, you very cool. much for that. I suppose just, just one first uh, question from me. What reaction are you getting from pension funds when you discuss your research with them? And uh, are they interested in considering adapting your framework? Uh, it's a good question. It depends what part of the, 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 the research we're talking about. Factor investing, it's a bit cyclical, cyclical, right? So factor investing 10 years ago, people were a little surprised. Oh, come on, you're claiming that the cap weighting index is not a good benchmark, but the whole industry is using a cap weighting index as a benchmark. That was 10 years ago. After a few years, then I started getting questions like, okay, we understand that cap weighted indices are not good benchmarks. What would you suggest as a meaningful way for harvesting risk premia? So that over the last five years, there has been a big interest and a massive uptake in AUM invested in factor investing strategies. Now, more recently, probably partly due to the recent underperformance of factor investing, then there have been further discussions about the robustness of the factors and very interesting discussions, by the way. So it goes in different cycles and waves, but I think that by now there's a broad agreement that the cap-weighted index is not a good benchmark. Now, what should be a better benchmark? Of course, there's a lot of interest. Um, that's for the performance-seeking side. For the liability side, well, now this is very well uh, accepted. There's a lot of interest in people in saying, how can I improve uh, liability hedging portfolios by doing a good job at hedging, you know, second order uh, risk exposure. So exposure with respect to alternative risk factors like steepening and flattening moves. I think at least sophisticated investors have a good understanding or actually openness with respect to those questions. The, the most interesting one is the last one, the one where we talk about the friendliness of the performance seeking assets with respect to the liabilities. We've had a lot of traction with this research. A, a, an initial you know, a version of that research was actually supported by Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. So they were big promoters of more thinking about you know, alignment between assets and liabilities. And I see a lot of interest in the marketplace for a better alignment between assets and liabilities. Perfect. And, and I, I suppose it, just in terms of the implementation on building a, a multi-factor portfolio, you discussed that your portfolio, your, your research took the approach of an eight factor, uh, eight, using eight factors. I suppose, what are uh, the challenges of um, avoiding too many factors, you know, factor zoo, as people refer to it, um, and then also, I suppose we have this issue that uh, it seems that once uh, factors are discovered, they start to perform less well. So, you know, how do okay. people take those two elements into account in order to implement uh, factor investing effectively? Okay, that, that, that's a great question. Um, remember the quote from Eugene Fama. Eugene Fama said, well, all we, all we say in finance is you should hold well diversified portfolio along whatever tilts that you choose. So the, f the important question is choose the choice of factor exposure. So I think we should be, I mean, there's no pre-existing uh, uh, truth from academia that says these are the factors that you should be holding in a portfolio. Um, we have accumulated evidence that some factors have been rewarded in the past. And some of them, including value and size, have been rewarded. And the fact that we have uncovered to address your second question, the fact that we have understood why that, that they were rewarded and why they were rewarded has not led to a disappearance of those risk premia. Well, simply because they are risk premia, right? Everybody knows that there's an equity risk premium and the equity risk premium doesn't go away just because we know that there is an equity risk premium. The equity risk premium exists and persists because it's a reward for people taking on additional risk and that's the key point. And there still will be people willing and able to take this risk exposure and other people would like to shy away and seek protection from those risk exposure. And in this case, there are people paying the premium to, to those who are willing to hold the risk. Um, but yes, I mean, the, 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 the whole interest on the factor zoo and all these academic studies um, emphasizing that there are too many factors that if you don't pay attention, if you're not being very careful, you can easily get 
in equity markets alone with 60, 80, whatever factors, not all of them are robust, you know, uh, rewarded sources of risk exposure. So we need to be extremely careful when we measure uh, the exposure and when we think about why these exposures should be rewarded. So as always, just a very simple piece of, if you will, common sense or economic advice. Economic intuition is always key here. If you don't understand why a factor is rewarded, just don't, don't, don't invest in that factor. You have to feel comfortable in some form of economic explanation, which could be a rational risk premium explanation or some kind of limit to arbitrage or market friction explanation or some kind of you know, behavioral anomaly explanation, but at least you have to have some kind of explanation. And, and and maybe just going on from that as well as the choice of the factors, obviously the time period that's chosen to uh, consider the data is important. Is uh, I suppose have you is there a change over the period? Uh, if you use earlier time periods, obviously your data was from 1970 to 2016. Do your findings differ depending on different periods within that or earlier? Yes, or? yes, yes, they are. I mean, they they are high frequency and low frequency changes in in the factor rewards. Uh, we all know that there has been an increasing amount of literature on the fact that the size premium, the, 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 the magnitude of the size premium might, be, might have decreased over time for various reasons. Now that's a low frequency phenomenon, assuming it exists. Uh, and then of course there's a uh, you know, reaction to market conditions. So some people have been with varying degrees of success have been actively engaged in factor timing strategies or factor rotation strategies, whereby they try to identify a state of the world or market conditions in which certain factors are expected to perform better than others. And then they would overweigh those factors when those market conditions materialize. I mean, in principle, there's nothing wrong about doing things like this. If you can, uh, in, in a robust manner, uh, associate factor performance with respect to market conditions, then it would definitely make sense that you have a time varying allocation to those factors. Yeah. And, and, and this was just one more implementation question. When, when, when you're building a multi-factor portfolio, I suppose there are uh, stocks that will overlap between different factors uh, and, and uh, what's the best way to handle that? Uh, uh, d d yep. How do you approach that challenge? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, unless you build a long short portfolio, uh, unless you build your factors on the basis of long short portfolios, the correlation between these factors will tend to be high. I mean, after all, these factors are long only portfolios, right? Now, the best way to think about it is, well, but these factors are long only portfolio. Now, if you remove the common ground, which is the market exposure for all of those portfolios, then you're left with the excess performance of the factor with respect to the market. And that one can be thought of as a uh, long short portfolio. Now, even though these guys are long short portfolio, those excess performance of various factors are indeed positively correlated. They have positive correlation. Some of them have actually negative correlation, right? So for example, there's an overlap between low vol and, and, and size. And the overlap goes in that direction. The larger cap stocks tend to have a negative, tend to have a lower volatility compared to the smaller cap stocks. So you can control for these overlaps at two levels. On the one hand, you can control in principle these overlaps at the level of the construction of the factors. If you go for a bottom-up approach where you can try and avoid overlaps when building the factors, or if you have more a top-down approach and then you construct the factors on the basis of the factor tilts, then you can control for the overlap at the allocation level between the factors. So you can use your you know, favorite risk budgeting techniques and try and control for that overlap when allocating to multiple factors. There's one question that resonated with me as I, I, I work on defined contribution and the challenges, I suppose, of fees and implementing some strategies. But uh, I, I suppose, can you talk a bit about how best to access factors? I suppose the positives and negatives of active oh. versus versus passive in terms of that implementation method. You're asking a great question. So I think that there's if there's a single statement that our uh, 
that people attending this seminar should, should keep in mind is that whatever you think about factor investing, you are a factor investor. We are all holding factor exposures. Okay, so when I'm saying that I am a, promon a proponent of factor investing, I'm not saying much more than I'm a big fan of making these factor exposures explicit as opposed to, well, I'm implicitly holding factor exposure. I don't even measure it. I don't even acknowledge it. I don't even know what's going on in my portfolio. That doesn't sound good, right? But most of the performance that we are all obtaining from our equity portfolio come from these good or bad factor exposures. So regardless of whether we, want, we like it or not, we are holding factor exposures. So what I'm suggesting is we should make this portfolio factor exposure explicit. Now, in markets like equity markets where there's high capacity, I think it is definitely feasible to go for a passive approach and harvest those risk premia in a fairly inexpensive way. I don't see why we should be paying a high you know, level of active fees for harvesting passively, getting a passive exposure to risk premia. Now, if the asset manager, on the other hand, is adding incremental value in the way they actively slash dynamically allocate to those multiple factors and risk premia, then yes, this is a source, additional source of added value that I would consider like alpha, that would require, if you will, that will definitely require active skills and that justify higher fees. But in the end of the day, harvesting risk premium, it's all about beta. It's not an alpha business, it's a beta business. We're talking about normal returns. I don't see why there should be high fees associated with that. Yeah. And then I suppose looking at the, you mentioned about equities and the access within that asset class, I suppose, does, two questions on does factor investing work in emerging markets? And also, can you accommodate the allocations to private markets as well using a factor investing approach? Okay, um, in emerging market, there have been academic papers that have documented the presence and the existence of similar factors and with slight differences in the way they behave. But indeed, the concern, the potential concern is about capacity, right? So if we're talking about CalPERS or teachers, then how much exposure are they going to build in, in factor investing through these emerging markets and deviating from a pure cap weighted you know, benchmark that remains to be seen. So capacity constraints are likely to hit at that point in time. The same would apply for, of course, small cap stocks, obviously. The same would apply also for bond portfolios. I mean, talking about corporate bond portfolios, that's clearly obvious, but even for sovereign bond portfolios, to some extent, some factor investing strategies, including the one that my colleague Ricardo is gonna talk about, will raise questions about capacity and, and tradability. Um, and then you had a and second private, point. Private oh, market. sorry, yeah, private assets. So private assets, yes, we have reasons to believe that uh, there are, of course, factor exposures, obviously, in uh, you know, real estate, private equity, hedge funds, I mean, all kinds of, of, of alternative assets. Um, I don't think that, I mean, the, 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 the real challenge is data, right? So do we feel confident to have access to data with the kind of quality and frequency that allows us to measure the factor exposures? and then potentially to replicate or to generate factor replicating or factor harvesting, risk premium harvesting portfolios. It's not entirely obvious, but yes, we've seen recent attempts. I'm thinking about real estate in particular. I've seen two papers about factor investing in real estate markets. Of course, factor investing in commodities have been around for a while. So there it's kind of clear. And, and in private equity, we've seen work in that direction. But again, the, the question is, you know, what's the quality of the underlying data? Obviously, in the end, the holy grail would be to be able to uh, map all existing assets in our portfolio. I mean, the publicly traded assets and the privately traded assets, map them in terms of a set of common underlying risk factors. But I don't think we are there yet. We are definitely not there yet. At least we don't have access to any consensus in terms of what these risk factors should be, what they could be, and, and so on and so forth. So there's much more work to be done. 
As soon as you said it uh, earlier during your presentation, uh, there was immediate questions about uh, how is value as a factor more risky than growth? Uh, so could you just respond to that? Oh, okay. There has been a lot of work explaining why value is riskier than growth. One way to think about it is uh, growth companies, um, their, va their, 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 their market cap, their market price come from those growth opportunities. And those growth opportunities are less impacted by you know market downturns right including let's say the covid crisis um, if anything that could help uh, nurture some of these growth opportunities now value companies on the other hand they have lots of tangible assets in place during market downturns there's a lot of frictions involved in uh, uh, scaling up and down if you will the size of your activities when you have a lot of tangible assets in place that's much easier for growth companies to do. So in that sense, growth companies are likely to better cope with bad times than value stocks. And this has been demonstrated time and again during all you know, past crises, including the, the recent one, but other crises where we saw the growth stocks were holding much better. And maybe just uh, on uh, just uh, just one final question, really going back to uh, yeah your comments on the recent uh, uh, on COVID and the current economic crisis that we're going through. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, uh, some factors performing very well over the last few months, in particularly low vol and momentum, uh, largely influenced by some of the stocks that you mentioned. Uh, but I suppose, what do you think the learnings from what we've gone through over the last few months in in markets are for factor investing, and do you think they'll influence uh, investors thoughts on factor investing going forward it's it's a, it's a very important point i think it's a very important question uh, factor investing is currently going through a lot of scrutiny and and discussion and and debates and arguments which i think is by the way which i think is very healthy you should never think things as granted right for, for taken to them for for granted because they've been working well in the past so that that's healthy um what i think we should uh keep from this experience is we should always keep in mind that if we are in the business of harvesting risk premia, we should have what it takes in terms of risk budget and capacity to sustain pain in our portfolios to be in the business in the game of harvesting risk premia in the first place. So yes, what I think was a very uh, clear case was yes, some of these factors have suffered a lot that was entirely expected and and we should come to peace with the fact that it's going to happen again it's only on average across multiple market conditions again including not only the early ones but also the bad the good and the very good ones that we will be able to exhibit out performance so i think that's one important uh, finding the other important finding i think is the emphasis on the uncontrolled risk exposure some of the uh, factor investing strategies that have performed particularly badly had uh, biases, in particular market exposure biases, a beta which was not equal to one. And remember that I briefly discussed the fact that we look at market neutralized uh, versions of the factors. That's really important because if you hold a low beta strategy, Right? Not because you are explicitly focusing on low beta, but because some of your factor tilts come unless you pay attention to that with a beta less than one. Well, when the market is going strongly, for example, then, then you have a problem because you're lagging behind, if you will. So um, in the same way, there are factor, not only factor tilts, but also sector tilt, right? So what I'm seeing is factor investing is all about focusing on factors for which you want to harvest risk premium. But when you look at your portfolio, there are other factor exposure, including, if you will, sector exposure as well, which I don't even want to call factors. They are just sectors, right? But those biases will generate a lot of tracking error with respect to your benchmark. So you have to know whether you want to neutralize them or if you're happy to uh, take an active bet on those biases. And more often than not, what we uh, sometimes see is that uh, people are sometimes, investors are sometimes hurt by unintended bets. You know, factor biases 
that they were not even aware they were holding or sector biases that they were not even aware they were holding. So that is something that I think will be um, a collateral benefit of the crisis as always, a, a, a heightened focus on the control of factor exposure, all of factor exposure, sector exposure, I mean, all of these things, paying attention to all of these exposures. Perfect. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I think that's a very uh, important aspect to, to finish on, really, the importance of factors for all investors, whether they're explicit or implicit within their portfolios. Um, this has been a hugely insightful uh, session. So thank you very much, Lionel, for sharing your expertise with us today. And thank okay. you to everybody for watching. After this session, you will all get an email with a recording of the webinar, uh, a short survey and a link to upcoming webinars. Please do give us your feedback. It helps us make these sessions better and we hope to see you at future events. So thank you everybody again. Thanks a lot.